This is the MFG Monkey Podcast. We sit down with leaders and innovators in the industry to talk about manufacturing, business, and the stories behind their successes. I'm your host, Dustin McMillan, owner and founder of McMillan Co. All right. We are here today with Josh Wintermantle, and uh, we're kind of laughing because we did this once, and I... I screwed Josh's name up, so we're, we we kind of started over. Josh comes to us; he's the founder and CEO of Hype Socks, uh, U.S. manufactured. So we uh, connected. Well, you actually, I you tried to connect with me a couple months ago, and and I kind of ignored it, and then we finally connected about a month ago, and just kind of hit it off. So thank you, thank yeah. you so much for coming in. Absolutely, you know I'm excited to be here. Thanks for yeah. having me, Dustin, for sure. Yeah. So it, it's kind of a funny story because we we did hit it off really, really well. And we started talking about just us manufacturing and, and got into your sock company because I started looking up, you know, a little bit about you. And, and I was really intrigued by, you know, one, your age and two, the things that you've done so far, uh, with, with the manufacturing of hype socks. So tell us a little bit about, about hype socks. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, hype socks is my baby. You know, I joke yeah. around. It's like one of my, my children, you know, so I'm 28 years old. I started hype socks or, or really started selling socks, started that movement of hype socks about 10 years ago. You know, I was 18 years old. I was in high school. Um, I was, you know, wanting to be a college basketball player at the time. Right. And it was in the spring, you know, I saw a Nike product and it was that Nike elite sock with the stripe down the back ended up being a billion dollar category for Nike. Wow. I took it. They only made eight colors, black with the white stripe down the back. Mm -hmm. We figured out, you know, just me and like some buddies in high school, right? How can, how we can, you know, dye this sock. Right. Right. And we figured that, you know, just using the basic RIT dye at your Kroger or whatever, super inexpensive. You just basically heat it up on your stove and you can dye those socks. I made a hundred different color combinations Nike actually ended up coming after me legally and said, Hey, you know, um, maybe you're tarnishing our brand. You know, you're selling all these Nike socks, whatever. I kind of said, Hey, I've made you guys this much money. You know, I had to get an IP lawyer, right. Or right. whatever. I'm real scared. You know right. what I mean? I'm real young. And you know, I, I find this amazing attorney who ends up winning me a lawsuit several years later in the IP law, you know, category, but I had found him back with this. So we always joke around about it when Nike came after me and I said, I made you a bunch of money, but we'll do whatever you want. You know, it's, I'm not, right, I'm not sure. trying to litigate you. I'm 19 or whatever. When right. They, when they had and you could be a like, huge customer. <laughs> yeah, I could be a huge customer. So yeah. that was my first thing with socks. And, and really from there, uh, I was sitting on the bench, you know, my team was, I remember we were ranked like fifth in the country and um, it was, a, it was D3, you know, Emory. And we were playing this school. I'm sitting there on the bench, the school's Navy and they have Royal blue socks on. They just weren't able to get their hands on Navy socks. Right. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. You know, I was kind of in the sock, the sock market or whatever. (laughs) My friends are like, is there a sock market? Can you have a sock company? You know, they're kind of making fun of me maybe at this point. Right. But, and everyone else on the bench is thinking about drinking and girls after the game. So the guys at the end of the bench, maybe put some, put some vodka in the Gatorade bottle or whatever. Right. You know, we weren't so, you know, but here I am and, and I'm sitting there and I just can't get over that. And I'm like, that's a huge market, you know, just matching these team uniforms and so I eventually got away from selling that Nike sock just because I didn't want any beef with them or, or whatever you want to call it. Right. And began to sell my own sock. And so in order to do that, I had to have the sock manufactured. Mm-hmm. You know, I wasn't buying the Nike. I was literally going into finish line using a 20% off coupon. <laughs> and I'm like, you guys are retailing me. Like, how are you going to send me this letter? You know what right. I mean? Because sure. I'm making them all this money. And I would go in and I would actually go into like the finish lines and say, I want every one of these socks that you have. And I'd walk out with trash bags full of them. Wow. I'd dye them all. Like everyone I could get my hand on, I could, you know, I could sell. Mm -hmm. I was selling them for five times the retail on eBay though. Wow. Just because they were black with orange instead of black with white, for example. So, wow. You know, but then back to making that transition into, you know, the team business, um, there happened to be this town that was two hours away, Mm -hmm. Fort Payne, Alabama. And when I Googled, you know, U S sock manufacturers, at first, I didn't really understand that there was geographic locations where a lot of these sock manufacturers were located or a lot of, you know, a lot of these industries had, you know, concentrations of certain industries. Right. Whatever. I understood in Akron, they made tires. That's where I grew up towards there, the North Canton area. Right. So I kind of had an idea of that, but I didn't really understand that, you know, something like socks would be like that, for example. Sure. So, you know, I began to 
make some socks with one factory in Fort Payne. And she was really mom and pop, like super small, even being, you know, a 19 year old, I was a huge customer for her. And I remember I went over with a group of three of my colleagues, my, my three employees, you know, the ones mm-hmm. I had at the time, they're kind of like my main people. We went over with suits into this town. Right. I had never <laughs> been there before. Right. In Alabama. In Alabama. <laughs> right. The town is 10,000 people. Yeah. I mean, no one has a collar, much less, you know, sure. a, a suit. So it's yep. like when we go into there, you know, the first thing we did is on the way into town, we stop at a town of 400 people, right? Go mm-hmm. figure. And we have the suits. And I mean, these people were like, it was a mix of concern, question. Oh, yeah. They had who, you know, they, they hadn't seen someone walk into their little diner, you know, in years in a suit or ever. Sure. I mean, in a suit. Sure. So what are you guys doing here? You know, all this stuff. Well, we end up having basically hour intervals. We meet with all 15 factories in this town in two days. Wow. To save cost, being a young company, I'm like, sure. we don't want to stay there for four days. I want you guys like back in the office selling socks, whatever. Right. So we go over there and, um, you know, we have these hour interval meetings and meet with every factory that's left in this town. We end up working with about six of them. Okay. And, you know, we worked with the six of them for a couple of years. No one really took us under their wing. Maybe it's because we were young. Uh, who knows? You know, we just didn't have enough respect or whatever. We were, you know, in, in the, um, you know, seven figure category revenue, maybe just mm-hmm. barely at this point, you know, sure. kind of get, getting up there. But what we really realized is we had to put it all under one roof. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, 2015, um, you know, four years into, into it or whatever, about six years ago, we opened up our own plant. We still worked with some of the other places. We actually still work with that same mom and pop place I told you about today. Right. You know, she has six machines and she gives us a great deal and Mm -hmm. and we're happy to work with her and give her some, you know, some business that, you know, just kind of help with some of the knitting and stuff like that. But, um, you know, 90 some percent of our socks now are of course knit in our own place. And, mm-hmm. you know, then fast forward in 2017, we actually moved out of this building that we were renting and bought a building 20,000 square feet and moved all the equipment that, you know, we had reinvested our profits in back into that. Sure. So that's where we are today. You know, we, um, you know, manufacture the socks there mm-hmm. and are able to basically make sports specific um, socks to, you know, sell to basketball teams you know, we've researched and developed a sock for each sport. And so it's a sport specific catalog. If you're a volleyball coach, you know, you can go to the volleyball section and, right. you know, check out for your team. And um, that's been huge for us. And then we've really um, made a huge transition recently into being a fundraising company. Okay. I would say that, you know, about 35% of our revenue now is fundraising and only 65 sports. Wow. Um, and so we'll do a lot of elementary school fundraisers. Uh, you know, they send home that little piece of paper that, right. you yeah. know, Tommy and Billy sends one home. What's great about the elementary schools is if, you know, Susie needs one, Beth needs one too, right? It's mm-hmm. like, they don't like to leave the kids out. So right. we see some of the biggest orders participation wise um, from these elementary schools. Okay. And it's obviously a fun item. It's unique. Yeah. You know, they have a t-shirt or two that they've got from the different events that they've been a part of. Right. The socks are something different. It's also something that, you know, because it's a workout pair of socks, it's actually very practical, right? Mm -hmm. Like people don't have 40 pairs of workout socks or whatever. They have 40 pairs of socks, but, and people work out maybe every day. So, you know, um, relative to the amount of socks that people have, you know, a workout sock is going to be something that's a little more effective than a t-shirt. People always have extra t-shirts. So, right. No, that's, that's awesome. I, I just, when you started talking about your story, when we first met, I kind of fell in love with it because it just. It, you know, I resonated with it. I, I wasn't smart enough to understand my own product like you were. You know, I always, um, I made my money selling other people's product and, and going at it that way, which has been, I mean, it's been a lot of fun and and all that. But I really, I always uh, envied somebody that could see a need and make a product and then make it successful, especially, you know, at a young age and, and that because so many people want to do it, Right. And it's nobody really grasp how to do it or what to do or, and some people spend their entire life trying to figure that out. So, and that's congrats. the thing, yeah. you know, at that time, it's like in my life, I was really looking for business opportunities. Yeah. So, um, you know, a lot of business opportunities continue to come, but yeah, um, that was a situation where, because I had my eyes peeled and I was kind of, yeah. you know, hungry or whatever, 
Sure. Um, it ended up, you know, it increased my chances of getting lucky. Sure. I think there was luck involved. I mean, yeah. this town that's two hours away. Some people are like, Josh, are you kidding me? Right. I mean, what are the chances? Right. I mean, there's no correlation mm-hmm. to me going to school in Atlanta and having this town in Alabama be a two hour drive. I still right. fly into that Atlanta airport when I go there. Right. You know, it's quickest to do the nonstop there than the one stop to Chattanooga. So, sure. I mean, we literally fly into Atlanta. It's like, what are the chances of yeah. this being almost like an Atlanta suburb? Right. Where all these socks are made. Yeah. And so that is lucky. Um, but, you know, from an entrepreneurial standpoint, I think because I was keeping my eyes peeled at that point and, you sure. know, inviting to these different opportunities, you know, it made it a higher chance for that luck to occur. Oh, absolutely. I totally agree with that. I, I'm i a big believer in, in what you think about will come. You know, you can almost will yourself into, you know, what you want. If you work hard enough and you're driven enough and you – think about it enough and you lose enough sleep enough over it and and you and you just work your ass off it's it's going to come and I am a big believer of that and I and I love people's stories um, that love it enough that they put their personal uh, their personal life almost at risk mm-hmm. you know where they've screwed some things up personally because they're so driven to do something successful that you know they they have different hurdles that they get over. You well, know. I can relate to that. Yeah. I mean, you know, for me, it was a situation when I was growing up, you know, I was a good student, you know, I mm-hmm. wanted to play division one basketball. I was getting recruited by Yale, Columbia, Okay, you know, to be a, a competitive academically, um, you know, in basketball, you know, you want to play D one mm-hmm. and, and you also, you know, want to go to a good school. Right. And so when I got letters from those places, obviously that was where my interest was. Yeah. You know, they didn't end up wanting me from a basketball standpoint, you know, I didn't end up being really good enough to, to go play at that level. Sure. But when I went to their recruiting places, you know, that's where Emory, for example, saw me. Right. At the time they had the third best undergrad business school. So when my mom told me that that school called, I had, I actually had the under, uh, undergrad business school rankings memorized at the time. Oh, wow. So I was like, oh, that's, you know, that's number three. Right. I mean, at least the top 20 when I say the rankings. So, yeah. um, you know, and, uh, basically there was a huge situation where for me, you know, I was, I went five semesters to the school where the average ACT was 33. Mm -hmm. You know, I had all these friends that were super smart. Yeah. And for me, I got in because of basketball. I mean, you know, I still got a a high test score, but you know, I probably would have not been able to get into the school without basketball. So, you know, I felt like basketball had gotten me to that point. And then, you know, I was really giving that dream up of kind of that academic world and that world where I would go and get a, a good job with a good company, kind of right. a low risk and medium reward. I gave that up to pursue this sock dream. Right. You know, some people said, what's he going to do? Sell socks for his whole life, you know? Like, and yeah. <laughs> here I am today. You right. Know what I mean, so, yeah. um, it's been fun. It's obviously been a category that, you know, I never would have imagined that I would have been in. Sure. But now it has led to other opportunities and, other really even businesses within the sock market, sure. you know, other ways that we've vertically integrated mm-hmm. um, and, and just created businesses, you know, off of the different value that we've created. And right. Um, so it's been fun for sure. And, you know, no regrets. Um, you know, I wish that I would have had the opportunity to play basketball all four years. Those relationships that I, um, mm-hmm. you know, established freshman year, that was the, the worst part of it is just not getting to finish things out with those guys. But, right. you know, it was still certainly a situation where, I just didn't have enough time to do it all. And the business was the most important to me. So I definitely made some sacrifices and, and, you know, decided that, Hey, I don't see myself going and and getting a job with, you know, these companies kind of entry level. I'd rather see where the sock thing can go. So yeah. Why not start now and save 70,000 for my senior year or whatever? Yeah. And, and at the end of the day, you made the best economic decision. I mean, but everyone probably thought you were screwing up when you when you made the decision and that's the, to me, I, I think that that's the funny part about it, you know, because you, I think you get to a certain level that you have those people in mind for my, for me, it was my uncle telling me, uh, if I didn't go to college, I would never make anything of my life and I would dig ditches and, and I would never, you know, make it, you know, any kind of money and things like that. And, and my uncle and I have a great relationship. I love him to death. And I ended up not finishing my uh, bachelor's degree until 2018 or whatever. And part of the reason why is because I just wanted to prove him wrong, that I didn't need my bachelor's yeah. <laughs> degree to be successful in life. 
But that's the way he was. He still today is wired, and we joke around about that because he it him telling me that also drove me harder to prove him wrong. He made you a lot of money. Yeah, he did. And and not only that, he he just made me resilient because there was a lot of times that I would go sit down at a boardroom. And, you know, I'm sitting down with people from Yale or went to Denison and went to, uh, you know, Carnegie Mellon and, and all this. And everyone's, you know, going around the table, you know, where'd you go to school? And, you know, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, where'd you go to school? And I'm like, uh, Piqua High School. <laughs> you know, and they, it's funny. And, and they're like, how the hell did you get at this table? I'm like, I don't know. How the hell did you get here? And, and I do think that certain things happen in your life that just propel you in a, in a way that drive you harder to succeed. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely some, you know, comments people have made along the way that I yeah. kind of keep etched in stone, and I don't tell them. Yeah, I kind of thank them for it in a weird yeah. way. And it's, oh hell yeah, it's a lot of times people that you're close with, you know, people yeah. that you love even. But yep. um, and, and there's definitely you know certain times. I mean, I for one have three older sisters that I love dearly. That's right. a lot of women to get mad at you if you do something wrong. So, yeah, you know, you're dropping out of this good <laughs> school, Josh. You know, I don't right. know about that, right? Again, you know, I lectured a class at University of Alabama, um, you know, about two weeks ago, and I told them, of course, your parents want low risk, medium risk. Oh, sure. Of course, someone that cares about you. You know, no one likes to get into, um, you know, saying that, you know, the way, Dustin, that you've went out and created this business, you know, a lot of people would think that you couldn't do that. And they would think, that you know, you're you're being too risky. You know, you should, you know, um, just go out, right, get that college degree, just kind of follow the rules, yep. get in line, yep. do what everyone else is doing. Um, but, but you know, those people are super motivating a lot of times and oh, they might not even absolutely. know it or they, you know, but just different stuff or, or you kind of know certain people might, you know, doubt you or whatever. Yeah. And I mean, that's what really drives you every day, right? It's like, yeah, that stuff's huge. Well, you know, and, and, and I think that a lot of self-doubt, you know, starts setting in. So I know it did for me. I, I mean, I can't speak for anyone else, but I know at the certain times in my life, you know, I had buddies that, you know, they were the corporate guy, they worked, they worked their ass off, they were making great money, you know, they were moving into big homes, uh, getting married, having kids, you know, driving nice cars, and I just, you know, there's times where I struggled and struggled and struggled, and I was like, God, maybe I, maybe I just need to go back and get a job, maybe I'm doing this wrong. You know, and, and there's some self-doubt there. And then when you stick with it and you keep trudging forward and you get through all the muck and things start breaking loose a little bit, you're like, okay, this is why I sacrifice those things. This is why I, you know, you know, drive a 10-year-old vehicle and, you know, things like that because it's uh, – it is rewarding when you when you make those sacrifices, for sure. There could be two voices inside of you a lot. You know, oh, yeah. You're, you're moving forward. You know, there's that voice that's kind of saying, hey, you know, maybe these people are right. Maybe oh, yeah. you shouldn't be risky. <laughs> yeah. You know, you have this other voice that's like, you know, it, it's that strong one. And it's like the, this is how I got here. It's the yep. one that put you in that place in the first place. Yeah. And sometimes you have to, you know, dig deep and find that other voice um, to move forward with, yeah. you know, in the right manner. Um, it's easy to listen to that other voice for a few days and kind of get caught up in that and, and, you know, lose a little motivation or, or exactly just doubt yourself, no matter what scale you get to with your business, yeah. that always happens. You know, yeah. there's always yeah. a little bit of, Oh, you know, you know, even people could say like, should I have sold my business or, you know, um, for, for me, I've packaged my businesses for growth right now. I have no plans on selling my company. Sure. So, um, it's exciting. And, you know, oftentimes I think, you know, I could have created a nice little package with a bow on it and retired oh, yeah. or something like that, but th- yeah. that's not why we're here. You know, I'm right. much more competitive than that. So, right. um, you know, for me, I've got everything ready for growth and, you know, I guess that's what we're most excited about, but yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And, and I, you know, f- Going back to that, you know, those voices, I think that along the way, um, I'm guessing that you cut certain people out of your life because they were too negative. I mean, everyone that I talk to that's in a similar position, they, they just had, you know, you end up, you end up in life with like three or four good buddies and the rest of it's just all noise, you know, and, and you still talk to those people and the people that are positive and supportive you keep in your life. I think especially at a certain age and, and once you get to that age, you're just like, fuck it. I don't, I don't need you in my life. You're too negative. Right. You know, you exactly. just, you're a crab in the bucket. You beat me down every day. Why would I continue talking to you? Exactly. And you just, you move on. Right. And, and I think, uh, 
I've had a few people just get really upset because I just kind of ghost them. And it's, I don't owe you an explanation. You beat me down for four or five years. Like, exactly. Why? You know, yeah. it's a, uh, you know, the term that I like to use is good vibes only. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's funny cause maybe that's just something that, you know, um, you know, uh, certain people would use for, for all kinds of different reasons. But yeah. for me, it's a good vibes only with business to, you know, it's only worth so much money working with everyone. Like everyone's only supplying so much value. Right. If you're going to make it difficult on me, you know, if you're just going to come in and I'm having a meeting with you about something and I can tell it doesn't really matter. You just wanted to make the conversation difficult. <laughs> right. You know, yeah. I noticed that stuff. And, and yeah. for me, that's what I've, um, you know, became less tolerant to moving yeah. forward. Oh yeah. Because I've noticed that there's other people that are a pleasure to work with. Yeah. And I will say that, you know, the one thing that I always think of is one of the best parts about going to that school. Sure, I don't have my degree, but the networking, mm -hmm. like those individuals are easy to get along with. Yeah. You know, the, it's, it's you know, they're they're motivated. They're successful. They mean well. They're yeah. happy. They're, in a, you know, they're moving everything forward in a good spot. And so when yeah. you don't have that, it was, it was very apparent to me, um, you know, as I try to recruit people into my own company that are like those types of competitive people, right. That, you know, that's difficult. It's difficult to find someone like that. But when you have someone who, who isn't acting that way, you know, you gotta be quick to cut, you know, yeah. it's, it's not, you know, there's a lot of um, people who can be entitled, you know, for me, it's like, Hey, I'm going to set you up with a decent compensation plan. And, you know, depending on who you are and what you're doing for me, make yep. it worth it for you. Yeah. I'll pay you all kinds of money. This is a private company. You can make or save me all kinds of money. Right. You know, we're not venture capitalist backed. It's, this is literally right. like I'm paying you out of my back wallet. Like, right. Exactly. And so it's like, you know, <clears throat> there has to be value provided and it's, it's not, I pay you a whole bunch of money and hope that you provide value, you know, right. <laughs> it's performance based regardless. It's performance based. Yeah. So for my company, we offer a salary and, you know, then we do a quarterly bonus mm -hmm. and the quarterly bonus can be huge. Like that's, that's where for me, that's where I get that drive that I had when I was, you know, back in elementary school, going around shoveling driveways with kids to make money. Mm -hmm. I, I would call my buddy, yeah. do you want to go make some money today? Yeah. There was a certain kind of drive about that, yeah. a certain kind of passion that, that I had with that, where I'm going to go out and make money, you know, shoulder to shoulder yep. with my friend or whatever. Yeah. And, and that's what that comes back to is that quarterly bonus. That's what I feel. It's like, hey, we've made money. Let's put it up there. This is how much money we've made. Here's a quarterly bonus for you. But, but for me, I've had people who, you know, they're getting even the majority of their compensation in that quarterly bonus. And so oh, it's not yeah. to say that we haven't, you know, rewarded people for doing well. Right. Um, and, and in the same token, we ha we've had people that we've hired that haven't carried their weight, mm -hmm. you know, and then it's like, you know, of course, of course we don't have any extra for you or, or you know, maybe that person had to, cycle themselves out or, or right. whatever, but find happiness elsewhere. Exactly. You <laughs> yeah. know, every, you know, some companies, some jobs are not for everyone. Yep. I mean, you know, people were made to be managed, you know, there's different, um, I guess even like personality traits as we can, mm -hmm. for lack of better words that people have that, you know, different people are going to work better with different people. It's not worth having someone beat you down for five years. Um, no. you know, and so that's what I've learned recently quick to cut. It's better for everyone. You know, yeah. if, if it's not going well with a certain person in a position, you know, see if you can possibly use their abilities elsewhere. You yeah. know, and if not, it's going to be better for them to not, you know, be in a position that's not, they're not able to move forward. Yeah. And, you know, they're not making the company or, or the owner happy, if you will. Well, and everyone's miserable a lot of times around them. So they're, they're a cancer, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, yeah. and it's, and it's a horrible analogy because cancer is so awful, but mm -hmm. I mean, you have to cut it. Yeah, fast. absolutely. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know? It's, it's a contagion, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's, you know, as I'm telling these new people I'm hiring and, and building my team back up from COVID, mm -hmm. I'm looking for good people. Yeah. I mean, you know, we have to have good people. If well, the, you know, if, if person number six isn't good, how is person 10 going to be good? Right. You know, and, and you brought up a really interesting point when we were just walking around talking the other day or last week, I can't even remember when it was, was it last week? I think week it was before last week or week before. Yeah, I don't, I don't I mean, remember, all, but yeah, <laughs> so, but I, I thought it was kind of cool because you, you guys went through a lot of COVID stuff, we'll call it, and ended up, you know, really cutting down to the bone and restructuring. But the thing that stuck to me was you use it as a positive spin to kind of rebuild, reinvent yourself, get rid of some people that you probably 
wouldn't have gotten rid of if it wasn't for COVID. You you know you maybe were buddies with them a little bit and and the, they were just around. But this was a chance that it, it kind of gave you a clean slate a little bit to to restructure a little bit. And I thought that that was you know just an amazing uh, mindset to something extremely negative uh, to restructure and rebuild. And and it sounds like you guys are you know really making you know, big headway now that you're, you're getting back up and running. Yeah. You know, I appreciate that. I mean, you know, it's one of those situations for us, you know, I mean, we're selling a couple million dollars of custom socks right to the schools. You know, if our average revenue is, you know, let's just say several hundred thousand dollars per month. I mean, we have a situation where in April in 2020, we went down to 6,000, you know, total receipts. Oh, wow. So we went from, you know, a couple hundred thousand to Mm 6,000. So for me, you know, we weren't really able to even do the, the PPP program. And I mean, we literally were eliminated. I mean, yeah. Boom. You know? Um, and, and yeah, absolutely. You know, we had some people that had been with us for a couple of years. Um, you know, definitely a situation where if you took, you know, our highest paid people, how many of them did we need to make the business go forward tomorrow? Less than half. Mm-hmm. Why were those people still being paid in that position then? Well, we're trying to grow the grow the company, mm-hmm. but I think that there was a period of a couple of years where the company, you know, there was no growth being added by these people, mm-hmm. and 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 for that reason, they were paid a little bit too much, mm-hmm. and and I think that it was just a loyalty thing. Where for me, it comes back down to the passion with the shovel in the driveway. Yeah. These people went shoulder to shoulder with me in the trenches, so right. even if they're overpaid, I I just didn't fire them, even though they were like. They knew they were overpaid. You know, I did. Right. You know, we had people making salaries that I list to people that are surprising selling custom socks Mm -hmm. and it's all off of inbound leads. So for us, we were, we were really able to restructure and, and, you know, kind of going down to this skeleton crew and then building back up Mm -hmm. was what we needed to do. We needed to reset the organization, you know, of the business. Sure. And, um, you know, that's what we're able to, um, that's what we've been able to do and just kind of recruit some, you know, new people in with some, um, you know, expertise. That's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. We had basically five people that were the same expertise, the same skills, the same strengths. You know, they were salespeople. We needed some more creativity in there. We needed some more like marketing people. So as we restructure things, we've really built more of a sales funnel and the situation has, you know, um, allowed us to, you know, again, just restructure the organization, but make it to where, um, the sales force is a little bit more, um, you know, horizontal before we had one person doing the whole sales process. Now we have perhaps the same amount of people eventually that that will be back with us, but you have one person who's an expert in retention, Mm -hmm. one person who's an expert in, you know, the initial process of introducing the designs. Okay. You know, one person who's an expert in social media. Um, right. you know, some stuff like that. So we're really now recruiting for more specific talent compared mm-hmm. to just, Hey, we have all these generalist salespeople right. that we're passing the leads to that, you know, they're having to go through the whole process and it was more manual. Now it's more automated. So, sure. you know, our senior inside sales manager, you know, that we've promoted to the position, Luke Griffith, you know, he's done a great job going through and creating that sales funnel and, and mm-hmm. transitioning us from, Hey, you know, we could have five or we've had 13 before people that just are splitting up all the leads and working on them to, you know, this team who's attacking the leads in, in various ways, you know, more horizontally, if you will. So, because your, your sales model is more corporate type sales, not people going and just buying, you know, uh, consumer by based off of a website. So your, your sales cycle is way different. You're selling to schools and, and companies and, you know, all that, all those types of customers. That's right? exactly right. So, you know, for example, we'd take a list of every high school football coach and I have mm-hmm. to decide at what points in the year do I want to hit these people with marketing? Right. I mean, the July 10th blast, the one the week after uh, July 4th that we do every single year is the most important. That is the highest revenue um, driving campaign that we do marketing wise mm-hmm. the entire year. Um, you know, it's all about the time. It, Sure. And so we have all of the fall coaches. We, we organize it like that. We look at the fall season. And for example, we'd have football, men's and women's soccer, volleyball mm-hmm. for there's uh, men's teams and women's teams, even here in Columbus right. and across the country, you have, you know, everything down to badminton, 
right. we have a database for. Yeah. And, you know, we have water polo, you have Thomas Worthington and some of these teams, you know, crew, Upper Arlington, sure. you know, these different teams have bought from us. And for me, it's like, if we're not going to hit water polo, we're just losing. Mo- There's a certain amount of money that we lose. Mm-hmm. We have a lot of swim teams buy from us, which is funny because they can't really wear them, but you know, they wear them before or whatever. Right. The they're walking floor. around the pool with socks on and flip flops and exactly. Shirt. So, yeah. yeah, so we're, we're hitting that coach and, yeah. um, you know, the coach is really our customer, you know, our average sale is around eight, $900, let's say, right. you know, football co- uh, coach is going to spend maybe a couple grand, you right. have your basketball coach might spend, you know, a thousand, 1500, right. depending on if he's getting for the, the freshman. Um, and then you have, you know, even like sometimes tennis, you know, those teams will just yeah. buy $400 worth of custom socks. Oh yeah. You know, we'll do college golf teams. I mean, really it's every market buys from us, which is fun. Yeah. You know, well, and, and I think that it is a fun, you know, industry to be in, in, in your, your approach to marketing, which not many manufacturers do, uh, or not many manufacturers get is the analytics behind the marketing. And you, you take it to a whole nother level, um, where with MFG monkey, we're coaching a lot of manufacturers along on, on how to market, when to market, who to market to, how to market to who, and, you know, all those types of things with the different medias and, and that, and, and you take it to another level with the analytics, which I'm a nerd about, you know, I love just looking at the numbers and digging into the analytics and, and in our industry with metal fab and machining and welding and, you know, heavy uh, industry like that, the, the number of comments that you'll get on something are, it's pretty limited you know, where you you could probably deal with hundreds, if not thousands of comments on a post and to, to dig through those. So how you're evaluating those things and then adjusting your marketing according to the comments in the post it is a whole nother level of, of marketing that we're just now getting into or not maybe just not getting into, but maybe we're understanding it more now than what we did when Instagram first came out. I mean, Instagram's fairly, how old is Instagram? I don't even know. Man, at this point, maybe, you know, eight years or something of that. Is it really? Yeah, something like that, you know. Yeah. I think it's awesome. I mean, it's one of those situations where really, you know, no matter what you're selling, your competitor in that industry has done a lot of work for you. Right. Whether they've literally put paid ads dollars into adding traffic onto their site. Mm -hmm. You know, I might do a, Antonio Brown giveaway where, you know, you can basically, you know, you get 10,000 followers from his page because they, they follow you for a giveaway that he's doing stuff like that. Right. Uh, You know, there's all kinds of ways that, you know, will enhance the following, but, um, you know, with Instagram, it's a, it's a situation where your competitors have already done that work and they have all of the, you know, different um, engagement and they have Mm -hmm. the likes. And so let's say we're selling socks, you know, if you go to a different sock Instagram page, you know, you have your competitor on there with their customers liking the page, people that are engaging mm-hmm. them. So we like to go through and, and market to those people. Um, right. You know, it's something that is, is newer, um, you know, but just having software that can go through and extract, you know, all of your competitors' social engagement, mm-hmm. and then you can run ads to them. You know, it's something that is, you know, um, I suppose only against Instagram's policies, right? But, um, right. you know, something to where you can do that. And, and there's so much, um, you know, data that you can build, phone number and email wise that you can attack using Instagram. Right. So it's not only a, a situation where, you know, for clients that I work with, you know, we can create content, good looking posts, you know, mm-hmm. pe- people understand that side of it. They, mm-hmm. they do that themselves. Everyone really runs a content Instagram page that has one for themselves. Right. You know, they, they get that. That's not that confusing. But for me, I like to use it to do direct marketing campaigns to mm-hmm. more direct response. So hitting someone with a call to action, whether they're filling out a form, going to a landing page, responding to your email. I think right. that's a lot more effective. Um, you know, um, for us, we go through, we're able to target a lot of coaches, you know, Mm -hmm. we have a a whole business that we run on, on, on Instagram selling these custom socks to, to coaches. Uh, A lot of coaches have coach in their handle. So it's as easy as going to some of these pages, typing coach in, you know, we'll, for example, have employees who are in charge of sending a hundred messages per day. Yeah. Um, you know, we we normally send about a hundred messages per day per account. And so right now we're working on scaling. We're working on, Hey, these are the 400,000 that we want to, you know, send a direct message to. Mm-hmm. Um, and then how many accounts do we need to, to hit that? 
You right. Know, if one account can hit, for example, 36,000 or whatever per, per year sure. or whatever. So just kind of doing that math and figuring out um, how to attack, you know, all of that extracted data that we can get from, from right. Instagram. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, I, I think people kind of freaked out a little bit when, you know, Google AdWords were so hot for quite a while. And then that kind of fizzled away. And then I think people are like, oh, God, what are we going to do now? Google AdWords aren't as, you know, you can't pay a penny and get 10,000 leads anymore. And it, it's ever evolving. And it's just a matter of where you look. And I, and I think that manufacturing is so old school. And there's so many, you know, I forget. Um, we had a group on here called the MLP Group, uh, Manufacturing Legacy Partners. And they know these statistics, but there are, I forget what percentage of U.S. manufacturers that are owned by um, adults over the age of 60. And, you know, those those guys or girls, they're they're retiring, they're getting out of it, and they're either, they're either going to shut the business down because they can't sell it because they, they bled it to death and they didn't upkeep any of the equipment, or, you know, Jimmy's going to take over and he's going to spend dad's money, or it's going to be third generation and, you know, so it's really interesting in how that's going to shake down. But I, what I find the most interesting is the the big, really well-run companies that are very strategic in, in handing over their company, their, their third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh generation manufacturers that have been around since the late 1800s, and they've done a good job grooming, you know, grooming their children and grandchildren uh, to take over the business. And then you get, you know, people our age, you know, I'm uh, 12 years older than you, 11 years, something like that. Really bad at math in my head, <laughs> 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 even fair. simple math. Um, <laughs> but, you know, now that we're getting, you know, people 40 years and younger, 45 years and younger, starting to take over the, the helm, you know, now they're starting to get it. They're right on that cusp. You know, anyone older than me or my age and younger, um, people that are older than me kind of get it. You know, they, they have an Instagram, maybe, you know, I have a lot of buddies that don't even have Instagram or Facebook um, or Twitter. My buddies that are coaches have Twitter, but they don't have any other social media because they just don't want the exposure. They don't, they don't like the noise, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, a lot of these business owners also don't want it. And a lot of older, you know, CEOs that are running hundred million dollar companies, they just don't want to be in the public eye. They just don't care, you know, they don't want to be. Uh, but then you get into younger, you know, younger people that are taking over, they they get that it's a necessary evil mm -hmm. to grow because they they either do it and they're ahead of the curve or they're they're still way behind the curve of society, right? But manufacturing in, a, in, in the U.S. is behind the curve because we sold out in the 80s to overseas and became we became a service-based industry and now we're trying to rebuild and and manufacturing in Ohio is just it, it's hot it's hotter than anywhere else we're very proud of it here in Ohio um, and, and there's so many manufacturers in Ohio that are really doing great things and a lot of people are starting to understand okay if I grow and I want to reach more people it's on social media it's not you know, the old Thomas net book and Thomas net's probably going to send me a nasty gram because I'm, you know, kind of, <laughs> but, but, you know, even like a Thomas net directory back in the day, they were the only game in town. If you needed a machine shop and you were in, you know, Anniston, Alabama, you got on to Thomas net and you looked up machine shops that were close to Anniston, Alabama. And that was the only way to get your, you know, it was like the yellow pages for, you know, for the manufacturing industry. Wow. Well, now it's, you know, there it's everywhere. It's Instagram, it's it's LinkedIn are probably the two biggest mediums, in my opinion. And there's probably another one out there that, you know, you know of. <laughs> that That's probably hotter. But, you know, I do think that people have to pay attention to those things, even if it's for a branding standpoint. But I think that if you understand your target market, the buyer, you know, for us, it's a buyer or a procurement agent or an engineer, um, you know, like Connor sits in there and he needs to go find somebody or find something. I, I walk in and he's got just pictures on his screen. And I'm like, I mean, Connor, I'm curious, like, what are you doing? And he's <laughs> like, I'm looking for a supplier. And I'm like, okay, cool. Because I, I'm like, how is he looking? Because that's who, that's who's looking for stuff that we sell. 
And he's like, well, I Google what we need. And then I go to images and I look for what I want. And then I click on the image. And then that typically takes me to a website. And then if I see what I need and it takes me to the website, they're selling whatever that is. And then he's like, that's just how I search for things now. And I'm like, you know, now my mind is spinning a million miles an hour because if all the, you know, the alt tags and everything for images aren't correct on your website or on Instagram, you know, you could have that that picture that exactly what they need, but you just don't show up yep. because Google doesn't yeah, know what the up. hell that image is. Mm-hmm. So right. it, it is really the marketing piece is so interesting to me because it's it's such a it's a mind game. You know, it's a psychological mind game of how people want to buy. No, it's so, super interesting. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, and you have, you've taken it to a whole nother level. So yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. We, um, you know, it's funny. Um, one thing that we're doing right now, speaking of suppliers, <clears throat> I've actually found a tool that's unbelievable. I'm going to show it to you after the podcast here. I don't awesome. Know if, and we could, we could tell the, the, um, you know, the listeners too, but, um, you know, it's a, basically a way that you can get anyone suppliers. So I've actually went in and, and what I've done is I went up into the whiteboard and I put together the su- supply chain of the yarn and the materials going into okay. the socks. And so I started a company a couple, maybe two years ago now, Hype Yarn. Okay. <laughs> right, we have Hype Socks, Hype Yarn. Everyone right. knows me as kind of like Hype. This, right. This young guy, whatever, that came in here and, and <laughs> right. made these socks or whatever. Some people wanted to kind of like close the deal with me to be the man, you know, they've seen us grow there, you know, so right. Hype is kind of our brand. So we did Hype Yarn. And this tool that we use, we're able to go in and basically see who anyone's suppliers are. You know, mm-hmm. you might be able to use this in your industry, but if you type in, you know, really any company, it shows all of the imports that they've had that year. Okay. And so we've yeah. been able to go find a lot of these material suppliers. And it's funny because, you know, you mentioned how a lot of the manufacturers are above the age of 60. Mm-hmm. A lot of them aren't savvy with this type of thing, right? Mm-hmm. So yep. it's just an example where we've been able to go in really really you know shake up the supply chain it's kind of funny we call them on the phone we're like look we know you guys are getting it from here you know yeah. we can sell it to you now because we've got it from there stuff you know right just all kinds of different stuff and um you know it's funny because you know just these different technology tools and using the internet i mean it's so valuable you know yeah and i absolutely love that i can't wait to see that because for us i mean uh, we we're doing a big thing on reshoring and and kits working on this whole white paper on reshoring and there's so many white papers out there about reshoring it's almost overused so we want to make sure that when we release it it's it's new it's fresh it has it, it has it's different than every other white paper out there on reshoring and that is very interesting because we we've had quite a bit of business where people um especially through covid where you know we we've been tra- having trouble getting containers so we still import a little bit it's not you know, it's probably 10% of our business if, if that, um, but we, we've had a, we have a container right now that's 30 days late. So we, we push and push more and more for us manufacturing, but still to this day, you know, some of the technology just isn't there to be able to compete Mm -hmm. with overseas, even though, you know, container pricing is going through the roof. I mean, we just got a a quote yesterday for $9,800 to bring a container in, which is insane. I mean, it's double, triple, you know, what it was. We looked at flying a container over and it was $100,000 to fly a container. (laughs) And we're like, so we call, you know, we had like four or five different customers on this container. We call them, we're like, okay, you're, you know, you have this amount. We're trying to break it down to be somewhat fair about it. And we're like, yeah, it's going to cost $20,000 extra if you want it here. You know, it's, it is what it is. I don't, I don't know what to do. And we just really approach it that way because we truly didn't know how to handle it because we're just stuck. It's like, if you guys want to pay the 20 grand or we'll share it or something, we'll, we'll help and, and get it here for you. But then now it's, it's a conversation. Okay. How do we, how do we manufacture these things here? Right. For the same cost. Exactly. Because, you know, there's there's a couple of things that allow the Chinese to to beat us at our own game, and and one of those things is the government gives a stipend for things that they sell to us. So you know, if if we buy, you know, that glass that you're drinking bourbon out of, it uh, we can make it here in the U.S. for ten bucks, 
the the glass, the cost of the material is the same here as what it is over there. And, and the only differentiator out of that is if we don't have a component, uh, 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 some sort of raw material here that you can only get in China. You can't fix that. But if it costs the same amount to make here as it does in China, you know, China's government will say, well, we'll give you a, you know, 20% rebate to sell it. So you can sell it at a loss and we'll make it up to you. So the company is net. And that's how they're winning the game. But then there's so many other things that go into that with, you know, what kind of tariffs that we're doing and, and all these different things that, you know, our last administration tried to try to change and they were successful at a lot of it. Um, but to be more competitive in the U.S., we just have to figure out how. And and there are going to be things like the iPhone glass. You know, there's a com- component in the glass that can only be mined in China from what I understand. And if I'm wrong, I'm sure somebody will tell me that I'm wrong. But, you know, uh, but if, if we want to be able to make everything here, we got to figure out how to do it. Right. And, and there's some things that I just don't physically understand. You know, we, we can buy overseas for $5. Here it costs 25 mm-hmm. And the materials, it's the same. I mean, mm-hmm. it's a very simple product. The material is the material. So it's like, and the labor, the labor is a big difference. And China's starting to creep up in the labor pool. Yeah. a little bit. It's interesting. Yeah. I mean, with technology, you know, it, it's an, it's it's interesting. I mean, there's some jobs that, for example, you can get knitting machines now for the socks where, mm-hmm. you know, the toe is automatically seamed. Um, and that's an example where, you know, of course, we're cutting out our seamer. I mean, we have someone who sits there all day and seams the socks, right? So, you know, if you get that piece of equipment, it's cutting that out. I got gotcha. you. For certain products and certain supply chains, because of the speed, it can be better to manufacture, you know, in the U.S. Right. For sure. And as different tariffs and different, you know, stuff stuff there changes, you know, that creates opportunities as well. Right. But for us, it's been the speed. You know, mm-hmm. for us, it's, hey, you figure out who's on your football team in July and your first game is in August. So that can't be manufactured in Asia, you know, and sit on a boat. Right. Yeah. So that's oh, why yeah. it's cool for me. It's like it's the best business decision to bring – jobs back to that town in Alabama, you know, it's a situation where we're able to, um, you know, feel good about it. Right. In a, in kind of like this patriotic way, Oh hell yeah! but also it's good for our business and it's the right business decision too. So we're not, you know, sacrificing, um, you know, our hard work or the equity that we've built, you know, and there's not a football coach out there that's pro China. Mm -hmm. No, no, exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, every, every football coach or every lacrosse coach or yep. Every women's, basketball team if they know that they're buying a u.s made product they that's what they want they're community oriented yeah right and, I mean, and they feel like they're supporting u.s and 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 i think especially here in the midwest mm-hmm. you know and i really think that we're so patriotic in the midwest where there might be other sections of our country that really don't care um because they're focused on other things but uh and and i'm the same way if i can buy something for 20% more because it's made here, I just feel like I'm getting a better, more robust product. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like the person that makes it cares more. Um, I I feel like, you know, I'm that 20% extra is worth it. Mm -hmm. A lot of times it is. Yeah. A lot of times. Yeah. The quality is just better. Mm -hmm. Um, The materials better that goes into it. You, you know, especially in the metal industry, you know, just because you're buying a, a certain, you know, steel alloy, doesn't mean that it doesn't have sockets and wrenches and, you know, other crap in it melted down that meet that alloy where, you know, when you, you buy it here and it's domestic, you know that you're getting what you pay for and, and it's going to last longer. Right. No, for sure. You know, we work with uh, yarn suppliers all over the world. Mm-hmm. Um, there's one that we work really closely with They're They're in the U S and, um, you know, actually today I had a meeting with one of my main technicians and he was talking to me about just how that material that's made in the U S actually saves us a lot of labor costs because right. it doesn't break while it's going through the machines while that I'm going to call it a string is being fed into the machine. You know, there is no re- having to reset the machine back up when it breaks every seven minutes or whatever. Okay. Um, and so that's just an example of where, you know, sometimes, Oh, well that yarn was more expensive, but we're kind of saving money on the back end by having that higher quality. Sure. And so there's all kinds of different, you know, hidden advantages to getting higher quality, um, you know, uh, components to the manufacturing process, we'll say. Right. Yeah. And, and just the, 
and I, I'm sure even the machinery, you mm-hmm. know, I don't know where your machinery is made, but a lot of, you know, just the U.S. made machinery or, you know, German machinery or Italian machinery, you just know it's more robust. Mm-hmm. And and you can see that with different things that you buy. I mean, uh, you buy, God, I wish I could think of an example right off the top of my head, but you can you can think of something that you've bought that was made in China, and, and we're really beating up China right now. But you you can just feel it's tangible. Mm-hmm. Like you can feel this product is better than this product. And right. you could put a blindfold on somebody and, and they could go, yeah, this product's better. And, yeah. it's, and it's because of the material that's made out of or how it's put together and, and things like that. Absolutely. You know, you mentioned, um, you know, the fact that, um, you know, I think our machines are from Germany and – Italy, mm-hmm. you know, the two different machines that we had. And then we brought in some new machines that were, you know, Asian and they're kind of just sitting there right now, to be honest with you. It was a hundred thousand yeah. dollars or something that we, you know, I spent on it and I'm a little bit frustrated. Sure. It, it's like, I'm having to fly, you know, someone from Asia, you know, over to Alabama on your dime. If they <laughs> let it, that even yeah. happen or whatever, Alabama, yeah. but no. Um, and, uh, <laughs> you know, and so, you know, it, it's, it hasn't happened because of COVID. So it's been a huge issue for us where, mm-hmm. you know, we have these machines that are kind of ready to rock and roll, but even just the capability of learning what we can do with them, even if we learn how to use them, basically, you know, sure, Josh, you can buy equipment from Asia and learn how to yeah. do it. Come on. But, but there's, you know, different technicalities that are involved with it that, you know, aren't specific to, or aren't um, comparative to, you know, these other machines that we have. It's a completely right. new system. And, yeah. you know, there are some different things where, for example, the quills that, you know, hold the, um, you know, um, or the creels, excuse me, that, you know, hold the different yarn cones. Um, are just not as good. You know, they're mm-hmm. just providing extra extra labor work. So we're like, okay, we save some money maybe on the machines, but right. how much more labor are we going to pay now having our technicians have to work on those? So, yeah. you know, definitely. Yeah. Well, and, and Mac- Macmillan Co. bought uh, the Preco machine, which I showed you last time you were in, and we, we were a little late getting it, part of our fault. And there are a lot of things going on, but we were we were probably a good 60 days behind getting it. And we, we needed to set it up and we needed to run production in like 72 hours. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I don't even know. That's how it is. Yeah. I don't even know how we're going to do this. It doesn't even seem realistic to me, but I'm going to think it's realistic and therefore we're going to make it realistic. And I call the, we bought it from Preco. They're in Kansas city. It's made in Kansas city. And, uh, Connor actually calls them and they're like, Hey, you guys are going to fly somebody out here to sit help us set it up and run first articles and things like that. You know, when can you do that? And they're like, oh, yeah, we have you scheduled for, I forget what it was, but it was like 60 days out. And I'm like, that's not going to work. Yeah, <laughs> so, you know, no we, we can't buy this machine and have it sit here for 60 <laughs> days and then and then put some product through it. Like, we, we have to turn this thing on today. So I, I talked to a couple of the guys there, and they're like, we'll figure it out. We'll call you in two hours. And I'm like, all right. So two hours later, they call them. They they go. We're gonna have somebody there Monday. We're gonna fly them on on Sunday. They'll be there Monday morning. And I'm like, Are you serious? They're like, Yeah. We shuffled some things around. We got a hold of some other customers that don't. You know, they're not in the urgency situation that you are, and we'll make it happen. And they did. Now they were a little late because of all the snow and all that stuff, but they were here mid afternoon Monday and had us up and running, and and it was awesome. We would have never. In a million years, got that service if we bought it from Italy or Germany. I mean, it's just different to get someone up on the phone, right? Yeah, I mean, especially in today's level with yeah. a little bit, right? Yeah, and say, "Here's my situation." They understand, like you know, yeah, it's vital that this person gets this up immediately. Yeah, they were able to help you, but and then, and just, then right. you know, we're going to have issues. You know, we've never owned a machine like this, so you know, immediately we get it fired up, we run it, we're running great, and then something breaks, and we're like, we have no idea how to fix this, you know, and. It, so we call them and we get them on FaceTime and, and they help us, you know, fix the issue. And, and it's just that level of service that we can provide each other. And and I'm a true believer that we have to be on the same team in the U.S. to to be the manufacturer dominator in, in the world again. And we all have to play together. And, I mean, the and, way the sock factories in Fort Payne work together is pretty incredible. Sometimes it's, it's very cool. Yeah. Um, you know, Hey, we have blue of this material that you need. Okay. I mean, we do a lot of trades. 
Awesome. I mean, we literally trade trade material know, materials and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Where it's like, you know, hey, I have this order. Like, we're getting a lot from the customer. Like, you know, it's it's worth doing and stuff. But mm -hmm. you know, we need this certain kind of polyester. You know, we don't have it in gray. One of our neighbors does. They'll take right. some material that they have. You know, it's kind of one of like the main whites or you know. Mm -hmm. And you can just kind of equal equal trade value. So they're in Fort Payne. That's what they do. There's a lot of you know bartering and different right. stuff Good old that goes boy. on. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, and uh, it's it's a lot of hey, my cousin, you know, is in this mill down the street and he has this, and so that's where I've seen you know these these people that are left really work together, and and there is that yeah. sort of team atmosphere within it yeah just because it's kind of they like they're competing each, with i'm sure all right. these people know each other and yep. they've probably worked at all the mills or oh yeah you know family works at certain mills like Absolutely. you said and so how many you said fort Payne? how many sock manufacturers are left in fort Payne? probably about 15 really um, out of how many at the height? 130 holy shit yeah 130 there was even people who were had sock machines in their garage that ran white socks and then wow. sold them and, and worked from home, if you will, like, you know what I mean? Just had a sock right, machine. Right, moonlighting, yeah. And they and they kind of knew how to do it, and they had four machines, and, like, you know, and then, you know, the one thing that I realized about the area that I thought was really cool, and, you know, coming back into it, meeting different people there, there's a lot of entrepreneurs. There's a lot of these people right. who were like, hey, there's all these people in town manufacturing. It's interesting to see which individuals with which personalities, <laughs> you know, were the ones that right. figured out, hey, if I own this, you know, that I don't have to fold this stuff anymore. Right. Yeah. Um, and of course, a lot of it is old money or, or there's a certain name and they've owned the sock factory. But no, a lot of times it's like, you know, Bill was a hustler and look right. what he's done. And now he has all these machines he's trying to sell me. And, right. you know, it's kind of cool to see what people have done and um, just to see how entrepreneurial, you know, a mm -hmm. little town like that could, could be back in the day yeah. manufacturing. Yeah. Well, and, and people probably see a certain thing that could be done differently and, the company doesn't want to change because they're, this is our process. This is the way we've always done it. We don't want to change. And that's, you know, there's probably, it probably stemmed from one stock manufacturer in that town. Yeah. You know, if we, I don't know if you've done this, but if you look way back to, you know, the, the conception of sock manufacturing in right. that town, it was, it was like, like one person. Yeah. It was probably, yeah. One, one person, one sock manufacturer. And then there's a disagreement and they split off and somebody saves some money. You called it's, it. Yeah. You literally, you <laughs> yeah. know, it sounds like you've already read. No, I'm, no, I haven't. I'm but, just joking. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you already like, yeah. you know, it was, it was so-and-so and so-and-so. And, so, and then it was so-and-so versus so-and-so. You know what yeah. I mean? It's so, I mean, you know, it's, it's definitely the case. And, and then, you know, more business sprouts off of that. And you see the little mom and pop ones go out or, Again, people literally just running out of their garage, like yeah. you know, crazy situations like that. But that's awesome, though. Yeah, and it's it's really cool. My in my hometown, there was a an underwear factory. Oh wow! Yeah, and it's how random. And it, it they made like the long red underwear that had it was buttoned down, had the flap right like flap on the butt, so you right. didn't have to take the whole thing down. Yeah, <laughs> and it was such a random. And I I'm trying to remember if they were still in production when I was a kid. Or if it was always closed down, but we used to have like the underwear um, festival and everyone would wear their red underwear. It was like, you know, a very Midwest, uh, like yeah. almost uh, like you think of the, the movie Fargo, you know, yeah, like yeah. it felt like that when I was a kid. Yeah. Um, but it, it's so cool to see textiles like that still being made you know, here in the U S and hopefully a lot more of it comes back. Definitely. You know, we also have our friends over in North Carolina. So that's, what's nice to know too, is there's people over there that, you know, mm -hmm. they're kind of almost around Charlotte is where they are, but they're, okay. in, you know, a pretty obviously rural area over there and Hickory, North Carolina, some different places that, you know, there might be another 15 mills over there left too. So okay. in Alabama, it's kind of concentrated into this one town and then North Carolina, it's almost like through a Valley more where there's maybe, you know, it would take you an hour or two to drive from one side to the other, but gotcha. that's where really all of it is. But there's some left, you know, they're, they're still going and, you know, it's interesting to see, you know, a lot of them, you know, what, what are they going to do? How are they going to adapt? Right. Um, really, I'd say the ones that are left have adapted in some format. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of, I'll use the word savvy, um, you know, they're, they're older, but they're savvier in the sense of they've found some way to adapt since everything just went overseas and, you know, sure. they lost their accounts or whatever, 
that they kept their factory up and running and right you know there's always some unique account or you know kind of like more proprietary more um you know specialty good that maybe they're making somehow for someone right maybe because of the turnaround something like i'm doing um, right for sure that's awesome well i dude i really appreciate you coming on it it was like it, it was just so so much fun meeting you and then it just really went okay let's do a podcast together no, thanks and Justin. it, and it yeah. was absolutely fun i i'm just very fortunate that you came in and and sat down and joined us and i'm you know i'm sure we'll be friends for for a long time after yes, this sir. just yeah. uh, just networking together and bouncing different uh ideas off each other absolutely but, but for our listeners because i know you'll you'll share the hell out of this but um for our listeners and new listeners that um that are going to come how can they get in touch with uh, hype socks and where should yeah. they go yeah, awesome. So hypesocks.com, you know, that's where you can, you know, go on and request artwork for your organization, whether okay. you're a business with a logo, a restaurant, or of course, like we specialize in, you know, a high school sports team, youth sports organization, perhaps you can go on to hypesocks.com. You know, our team will outfit you with tons of designs. We send free samples in the mail too. Perfect. So if you need some socks, you know, go on to hypesocks.com, contact us. We're happy to send some pairs out. Awesome. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, we're excited about the future and, um, just kind of leveraging our marketing campaigns into even some other products here. So cool. definitely stay tuned. We'll have to get our monkey socks on order. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 I'm surprised we haven't, I haven't already closed that one. <laughs> All right, buddy. Thanks, Thanks Dustin. Thanks everyone for joining us for this episode of MFG monkey. If you have any questions or suggestions for future episodes, please email them to us at info at mfgmonkey.com.